you can control the power because leaders are in a position of great power. And this is what happens to a lot of celebrities having their regular human being lives. And then they suddenly become celebrities and then they can't handle the power. They can't handle the amount of energy thrown at them because that energy, you know, when you have a crowd of 100,000 people yelling your name, that's an incredible amount of energy coming towards you. You need to be able to handle that. So when I was watching a few interviews, they were basically saying how, you know, they go into these rock shows, these bands, and then they're in ecstasy, right? Because for like two hours, they're being adored. They're being admired. And then the next day, they're like, we just sleep all day because it's boring. Like the next day, nobody admires them. It's definitely not a regular day. Like to us, to you and me, the next day would be a regular day. But for them, the next day is not a regular day. The next day is depression. It's an extreme low because they had an extreme high the night before. So again, you have to be able to manage the energy. You have to be able to know which energies are good, which energies are bad, which energies to take in and to grow, which energies to push out and not let affect you. And then when you do have a lot of positive energy coming to you, you have to make sure it doesn't go to your head. If it goes to your head, then again, you're creating karma to yourself. So it's a question of balance. And if you have balance, you can be a rock star, a multi-billionaire. You can be the number one actor and you'll never lose control. You'll never lose control because you'll always manage your power, your vibration. You'll always manage the energy coming towards you. And then you won't lose it because again, it's gradual. They get, let it get to their heads and then eventually they hit depression. So again, live in the present moment and take everything as it comes one by one, especially when it comes to people's energies. Hello and welcome back to my channel. My name is Sarah and I'm a life coach who's going over the Gene Keys. The Gene Keys is a book by Richard Rudd. It explains your DNA, your hologenetic profile. You can find your hologenetic profile by going to genekeys.com and typing in your information, which will pull up a set of keys, Gene Keys, that are pertaining to your path. In today's show, we're going over gene key number 22. Now, gene key number 22 is a large gene key. It's a large chapter compared to the other ones. Just like the other gene keys, it's important. However, it hits a milestone. So get your coffee, your tea ready. It's going to be an interesting one. It's beautiful. It's intense. It's long, but it's powerful. And it's definitely one that's going to affect you in a positive way. I'm not going to do a recap because it's already going to be a long video. So I'm going to try to make it specifically just for this gene key like that. We remain effective and efficient. So in today's show, we're going to go over gene key number 22. So gene key 22 grace under pressure. So what happens when you're under pressure, you become graceful, just like a diamond. A diamond needs pressure to become a diamond. Never forget. So gene key number 22, grace under pressure, programming partner, 47th gene key, codon ring. It's part of the ring of divinity, which consists of gene key number 22, number 36, number 37, and 63, physiology, solar plexus, cranial ganglia, and amino acid, proline. Introduction to the 22nd gene key, the sweetness of suffering. The 64 gene keys represent the seeds of a brand new synthesis coming into the world. It is important to clarify here that it is not the knowledge of the gene keys themselves that is new, but their revelation together as a complete matrix of the human evolutionary program. Each gene key is a portal to an encyclopedia of timeless knowledge and wisdom. Deep contemplation and meditation on the gene keys will open up a new world to you. There is no question that cannot be answered by them, 
since all the answers are inside you. Furthermore, as you enter the higher frequencies of the gene keys, the questions themselves begin to drop away and the higher states reveal themselves from within your very own DNA. At this stage in your evolution, the knowledge itself ceases to hold any real interest and you see it as nothing more than a bridge that you can now discard. This is reflected in the Buddha's own timeless words. My teaching is a raft whereon men may reach the far shore. The sad fact is that so many mistake the raft for the shore. The 22nd gene key is special within the overall matrix of the 64 gene keys, containing a highly specific teaching and a powerful transmission. The transmission of this consciousness alone can alter the way in which your DNA operates. In many ways, the 22nd gene key is a sister transmission to the 55th gene key, and between the two of them, a great mystery lies hidden. So the 55th gene key is another really important milestone, another really important gene key. So the 22nd and the 55th, and also the 64th and many others, but once we get to the 55th, you'll see. It's quite important like the 22nd. Just as the 55th gene key describes the process of awakening as a genetic evolutionary process rising up within your body, the 22nd gene key describes the process of awakening as a direct intervention of divinity coming down into your body. Thus, it is through these two gene keys that the forces of evolution and involution finally come together. As you enter the field of the 22nd gene key, you are involving yourself in a magical process of invocation in which you directly invite a higher presence into your life. In this sense, the 22nd gene key needs to be approached in a prayerful and reverent manner and in the spirit of nakedness. There is a great deal of information synthesized here. Let it descend into your DNA and rather than attempting to grasp it with your mind, simply appreciate what an awesome transmission it holds. The subject of the 22nd gene key is the true meaning of suffering. As you begin to contemplate the suffering in your own life, you will perhaps come to see what an incredible blessing it holds. This simple and sweet realization can and will transform your life. Welcome to the embrace of the Great Mother. The 22nd Shadow Dishonor The 22nd Shadow Dishonor The Akashic Ocean We have already heard the 22nd Gene Key is very special. There is no getting around this statement. Written into the evolutionary script are certain anomalies and divine cosmic surprises. In this respect, there is no other gene key to rival the 22nd. It is what makes the mythic drama of life so compelling. All great dramas have but one pervasive universal theme, that of redemption. Whether or not a drama ends with redemption, it is always there as a longing inside our human hearts. Whenever we watch or hear a film or story, if there is no redemption at the end, our hearts will feel cheated. Our minds may appreciate the art, but without a sense of atonement, there is the sense that a great truth has been misrepresented. The 22nd gene key is about the truth of redemption. To those of a strong intellectual bias, it will inevitably seem fantastic or romantic since it concerns the direct intervention of the divine in the ordinary world. The world that most of us see is not all that exists. We mostly live within very defined and closed circuit parameters. Human beings generally have no notion of the great cosmic laws that exist behind the world of form. One of the greatest of these is the law of divine memory. This law states that all thoughts, feelings, and acts are recorded everywhere within the body of the universe. Science now shows that we live in a vast information field of subatomic particles, some of which are so tiny that they actually pass through matter. This ocean of consciousness exists in many dimensions, and it responds to thoughts, acts, feelings, words, and even intentions. It is a vast quantum field that acts like a great memory bank, holding and recording every impression ever made. In the language of the ancients, it is often referred to as the Akashic Record. The 22nd gene key is deeply connected to this law of divine memory. It is like a massive receiving dish that responds to the frequencies, sounds, and vibrations that it hears, and it hears everything. 
So there's no hiding. If you're in a corner doing something wrong, know that <laughs> someone or something's watching you. <laughs> so next time you take a shower, think about that. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm joking. You never know. It's written in the Akashic Record what you do. Like a cosmic aeolian wind harp, reception is determined by the way in which the strings are tuned. In the case of the 22nd shadow, the strings of your DNA are twisted out of harmony, and your behavior and experience in the world is similarly misshapen. This is the shadow of dishonor. It only exists in the world because most human beings do not realize that all their acts are recorded. We do not realize that every act, thought, or feeling creates a ripple in the Akashic Ocean, and that each ripple must and will one day return to its point of origin. The 22nd shadow is one of the most powerful emotional shadow gene keys in the human genome. It is highly passionate and sexual, with a huge emotional range encompassing extreme highs of sweetness and extreme lows of violence. Because of its situation in the genome, it is directly or indirectly responsible for most of the relationship problems on our planet. So next time you have a relation problem, blame it on this gene key. Say, hey, it's not my fault, it's gene key number 22. Messed me up. I'm joking, you have to take responsibility for all your actions. However, before we journey any further into this profound gene key, it should be borne in mind that negative emotions in and of themselves are a natural part of the world in its current state. If they can be usefully transformed or sublimated into art, creativity, or service, their power is awesome. It is a matter of how much responsibility you can take for your own feelings. However, most people in the world today are utterly ruled by their emotions, and whenever you project negative emotional power at another being, you dishonor both yourself and the other person. This is reminding me of, you know, the villain and the superhero story. So they say the difference between a villain and the superhero is only one thing. That one thing that's different is what they do with the negative energy that receive. So the superhero receives a negative experience. So what he or she does is takes that negative experience, transmutes it into saving the world. So it's like, oh, I'm scared of this. Well, therefore I will become the person that can handle this and therefore handle it for the rest as well. And therefore they become a superhero because they don't let that negative energy taint them. It might taint them in the beginning, you know, once you get hit by the negative energy, you need a few days to process it, digest it, and then you can transmute it. You have to process it. And this is why it says, it's not that the shadows are wrong. You have to go through these feelings. So you process this negative energy and you transmute it. You alchemize it into positive creativity. And that creativity can be music, art, painting, whatever, you know? saving the world. However, the villain, what did the villain do? The villain receives a negative experience just like the superhero. However, the villain becomes bitter about it. They become revengeful. They're wasting their energy on how they can get back to the world, which trust me, you can never get back to the world. There's so much injustice. If you want to get back to every single one of them, good luck. You're going to have to come back many lifetimes for to cover all the injustices happening so it's not by turning bitter and finding revenge that you're going to grow you'll grow in the negative polarity not in the positive polarity and we all want to evolve into the positive polarity so again next time you have a negative experience tell yourself do i want this experience to turn me into the villain or into the superhero and then go from there Many so-called spiritual teachings suggest that you should subdue your negative emotional states in favor of sweeter, more virtuous frequencies. In fact, this is the basis of most of the great religions. But to subdue any state or feeling is to dishonor and distrust that feeling, which prevents acceptance. From the point of view of the 22nd gene key, every feeling, mood, or thought you have is put there directly by God for you to trust in it. Trusting this process is obviously not the same act as acting it out. 
Trust is a powerful internal process that requires great courage. One of the tricks of the 22nd shadow is to con you into trying to change or fix your moods rather than allowing them to simply pass through your system naturally. The fact is that you cannot reach higher states of consciousness without first passing through your own suffering. This is the true purpose of the Akashic field and the 22nd gene key. They invite you to receive your own slice of suffering. I got a comment by someone called Bryce. And it reminded me of Brice Denis Cassé. That's a comedy we have in France, which is a person called Bryce, but he's from Nice. Nice is a city south of France. So anyways, hilarious movie. So it made me think of that. Check it out. Brice Denis Cassé. <laughs> All right. If you do not take responsibility for your own thoughts, words, and deeds, the Akashic field simply sends the same forces back towards you again and again. This is the foundation of another of the great universal laws, the law of karma, which we will explore in more depth below. The three pure ones. As we enter deeper into the transmission field of the 22nd gene key and its shadow frequency, we encounter three streams of teachings concerning the nature of suffering left by three great world teachers, or avatars. These three beings are actually one single being, which divided into three fractal aspects over the course of human evolution. Even though these were individual people or magi, it is more helpful to see them as three fractal transmissions of the same truth. The first is Hermes Trismegistus whose legacy dates back to the age of Atlantis and whose name, meaning thrice great, directly reflects the triple nature of this transmission. Hermes goes by the names Toth, Merlin, and Fu, Si, to name a few. And apparently, Richard Rudd is the modern Merlin. And I completely, completely agree, 100% with Mr. Robert Grant. And Robert Grant, in my opinion, is the modern Indiana Jones. He's the spiritual Indiana Jones. So we have the spiritual Indiana Jones and the modern day Merlin. The teaching represented by this fractal is the teaching of alchemy or high magic. All true alchemy concerns the transmutation of suffering through alignment with divine will. The second great teacher is Christ, whose fractal represents the transmutation of suffering through love and sacrifice. Finally, the third great teacher is Buddha, whose fractal represents the transmutation of suffering through wisdom and compassion. Because all the 64 gene keys are influenced either directly or indirectly by the 22nd gene key, these three great fractals and their teachings form the essence of the gene key's revelation. The synthesis is made up of this great trinity of divine will, love, and wisdom. Cosmic Mother Beyond, behind, and between the great masculine trinity lays a fourth transcendent field of consciousness that is born from their interaction. This is the field of the Divine Cosmic Mother whose embrace encircles, protects, and contains all three of the great streams of the masculine avatar consciousness. Within humanity, the only direct portal to this great being is the 22nd Gene Key. The Great Cosmic Mother holds the master key to all suffering and stands behind the teachings themselves. She is a triple mystery of the transmission. Although she is beyond teachings, her way is that of grace, through suffering. Those who enter deeply enough into the three great paths through suffering, the alchemical, the sacrificial, the mindful, will eventually meet the Great Cosmic Mother since she represents the very spirit of grace that brings an end to human suffering. Contrary to the many depictions of the Holy Mother by religion, she is actually a highly ecstatic and sensuous field of energy. This is another way in which the 22nd shadow dishonors the true nature of the feminine through denying humanity the natural delights of sexual pleasure. As suffering comes to an end through her grace, true pleasure will dawn. The mother is a field whose shakti or sexually liberated energy actually devours your separate self and as she does so, you experience the highest of divine ecstasies pouring through your body and aura. 
this is no staid grandmother figure, but a fully laden cosmic breast whose celestial milk will nourish the highest aspects of your being. As we explore the 22nd City of Grace in more depth, we shall see how all-pervading is this field throughout creation. Once you come to realize that Hermes, Christ, and Buddha are in fact three aspects of the same trinity, you will find that these three streams of teachings bring much clarity when fused together. Through Hermes and the Magi, the teachings of alchemy and transmutation came into the world. Buddha brought the teachings of karma and rebirth, and the Christ brought the teachings of forgiveness and atonement. As these transmissions have traveled down the centuries, they have become so distorted and confused that they barely resemble the simplicity of their original transmission. Over the following pages, we will reunite these three great teachings and streams of wisdom, exploring the underlying fabric of the subtle worlds and processes that make up the human evolutionary journey. The Corpus Christi The Seven Sacred Bodies of Humanity there have been many systems devoted to the understanding of spiritual or occult science, those subtle layers of reality beyond the five senses. The great Oriental and Indian systems left us reams of intuitive insight laid down over thousands of years of direct experience of the higher realms. Towards the end of the 19th century, much of this experience became accessible to the West and many new streams of thinking converged. Theosophy and Anthroposophy were born and a new era of spiritual science came into being. Leading into the modern new age were so many ideas and lineages from East and West, both mystical and scientific, collided and merged. It is an exciting but also a confusing time as a grand new synthesis emerges from the cosmic soup. One of the enduring insights of mysticism is the notion of the subtle bodies of the human aura. Depending on which system you follow, there are between six and ten major subtle dimensions or planes upon which human beings function. These auric layers collectively make up what is known as the Corpus Christi, or Body of Christ. Listed below are the seven main layers of the human aura and their fundamental properties. So the seven sacred bodies of humanity. We have number one, physical. Number two, astral. Number three, mental. Number four, causal. Number fifth, Buddhic. Number six, Atmic. And number seven, Monadic. The seven bodies explained. So, body number one, the physical body. The physical body forms the bedrock of incarnation. On the physical plane, the collective memory of humanity is stored in our DNA. The ultimate goal of human evolution is to merge the physical body completely with the monadic body thus allowing the former to be assimilated back into its true essence. This corresponds to the ninth initiation known as the glorification, which is discussed at the end of this gene key. The physical body has a subtle twin counterpart known as the etheric body, around which the science of true health is built. Over time, the physical body more closely reflects the state of your astral body and its emotions. The astral body, number two. The astral body is the layer of the human aura that collects, stores, and transmits all human emotion and desire, from the meanest to the loftiest. In the astral body, pleasure and pain are reflected as vibrational frequencies, which effectively divide the astral plane into hell realms and heaven realms. The astral body is most active during sleep, when it processes your daily urges through your dream life. As the next layer to the physical and etheric body, the astral body also has a huge effect on your health. After death, the astral body is directly confronted with the true nature of every single emotional impulse you had whilst alive in the physical body. Number three, the mental body. The mental body exists at a higher frequency than your emotions and is constructed from your thinking life. The mental body is greatly influenced by the collective mental body of all humanity. This tends to pull our thinking down into the unfulfilled desires of the astral body. As your thinking turns to higher impulses, the mental body gradually disentangles itself from the astral body and takes on greater power. The mental body can also be used by lower consciousness to repress the natural impulses of the astral body, which can also lead to health problems at all levels. Number four, the causal body. Sometimes dubbed the soul, 
The causal body directly corresponds to the physical body, but at a higher level. It stores the collected goodwill of the human soul as a memory signature written in light. This finely tuned vehicle forms the storage hub for all the high frequency thoughts, words, and deeds that we have initiated during our many journeys in incarnation. After death, the lower three bodies disintegrate and only that which is refined and pure is drawn up and retained in the causal body. The causal body responds to the higher visions and archetypes that lie beyond language, but that can still be conveyed through direct transmission to the lower three planes. As your causal body develops more lucidity, the higher bodies can use it as a means of directing higher and higher frequencies to the lower three bodies. In this respect, the causal body is the bridge between the lower and higher planes. Number five, the buddhic body. The buddhic body is the higher octave of the astral body. As such, it reveals the pure truth that humanity and all the earth planes are in fact one single organism. Once your awareness is fully anchored in the buddhic body, the causal body dissolves and reincarnation in the normal sense is no longer necessary. It is through the buddhic body that human beings have access to the field of universal love and the higher ecstasies associated with enlightenment. It represents the third feminine realm of the Holy Trinity, that of divine activity. Number six, the atmic body. So you see, we have a lot of bodies. It's not just the physical. As the higher octave to the mental body, the atmic body allows human beings access to the higher evolutions outside the process of the physical incarnation. Whilst the buddhic body retains its connection to humanity through its compassion, the atmic body brings awareness into the cosmic field of Christ consciousness, directly merging your awareness with divine mind and heart, the second aspect of the Holy Trinity. It is through the atmic body that the great avatar streams enter the world. It is also the realm of the Siddhis, the many miraculous manifestations of the divine. Number seven, the monadic body. Hardly a body in our normal sense of the word. The monad is the unbridled primal essence of divine consciousness itself. It enters the world of the form through the causal body, which is the veil it takes on in order to enter the lower worlds and corresponds to the first aspect of the Holy Trinity, divine will. The monadic body is present within every single atom on all planes right down to the physical plane. However, until awareness has risen to the atomic body, the monadic cannot be fully expressed. When it does express, it condenses the atomic body and all the others along with it, revealing true divine essence as consciousness beyond understanding. At this stage, each of the lower three bodies, physical, astral, and mental, are absorbed into their high-frequency counterparts, the causal, buddhic, and atmic, thus revealing the true mystical nature of the trinity as three in one. Karma and Reincarnation The programming partner of the 22nd Gene Key is the 47th Gene Key, and there is much we can learn from this connection. The 47th Gene Key concerns the storage of world karma in human DNA. We have seen how the Akashic Ocean records all deeds through the seven subtle bodies, and how this physical storage takes place through DNA. It is here in the human genetic code that the world wound is to be found. The combined suffering and negative thoughts, deeds, and words of every human being since the beginning of time are wound up in the non-coding or junk DNA inside your body. Depending on the unique genetic imprinting of your vehicle, certain aspects of the collective karma of humanity are highlighted in your DNA, and these determine your personal karma and the essential script of your life process. All this genetic storage takes place through the 47th gene key. The 22nd gene key, on the other hand, concerns those aspects of our subtle vehicles that survive death. It is vital at this point to realize these higher subtle bodies that are said to survive incarnation are really aspects of the Akashic Ocean itself. They are like memory slates that overlap each other at higher and higher levels of frequency. At the highest levels, all the layers dissolve to reveal a single field of consciousness. This is why your incarnation is only a relative truth. It is relative to the body in which consciousness happens to be localized. 
With this basic understanding, we can begin to understand one of the great keys to all human suffering, the inability to accept responsibility for our own thoughts, feelings, and actions. Life gives us precisely the imprinting we can handle, and if we dishonor ourselves or others, we actually increase our own suffering in the long run. The Bardo states, Many teachings exist from ancient cultures regarding the states of awareness that occur during and after the process of death. These states are often referred to as Bardo states. It is only when we combine the teachings of the Christ and the Buddha that this process becomes simple and clear. At the point of death, your various bodies separate. Your physical body obviously returns to the earth. But your astral and mental bodies, which contain all the feelings and thoughts from your current life, begin an alchemical process of separation and refinement. The negative low frequency patterns are discarded whilst the higher frequency patterns are retained and drawn up into the causal body. Because you no longer have a physical body, emotions in the bardos after death are experienced more intensely than anything we can possibly imagine. In fact, emotions and thoughts actually assume a life of their own, appearing as entities, angelic or demonic, whose frequencies either cause intense agony and terror or intense joy and ecstasy. This process in the Bardo states is one of pure redemption in which the subtle aspects of your being meet the consequences of your actions, thoughts and feelings while you were in form. Every aspect of your shadow consciousness is purged and cleansed, Human intuition recalls enough of this process to integrate it into our various culture and religion beliefs. However, most human thinking makes a fundamental error here between the concepts of retribution and redemption. At the shadow consciousness, humans do not see the true operation of grace through Christ's teachings or forgiveness. We do indeed atone for our sins in the afterlife, but only in order that we can be given a clean slate before our causal body returns once again. Because there is no defined sense of linear time in the Bardo states, it can indeed seem that our hell is eternal, just as it can seem that our heaven is eternal. The 22nd gene key thus allows your causal body to become brighter and clearer from incarnation to incarnation, as you learn from your own suffering, both in form and out of form. At the shadow frequency, this process teaches you to accept your slice of group karma and offers you the opportunity to transmute it. This is what the Christ consciousness really is. It lies inside every single human being. We are forgiven over and over again, and the deeper we accept this grace, the more powerful the impulse of goodness becomes when we are in form. Eventually, our causal body becomes so resplendent that higher consciousness reaches down through it into the lower bodies, the mental, astral, and physical bodies, and begins to impact them powerfully. Our thoughts turn more to God, our emotions and desires become sacrificed for a higher cause, and eventually, even our physical body becomes radiant as the various slates layers over it become transparent. Instant Karma In the light of the above, karma can perhaps be understood in a new and beautiful way. Individual karma does not travel beyond a single lifetime even though it does pass into the human collective. Every negative act is reported for future processing in the Bardos, and it is stamped into the collective DNA of humanity, where it must eventually be redressed. Our karma at this level is shared, since humanity is really one entity. Contrary to certain popular beliefs, the conditions of your external physical life do not reflect your actions in the past reincarnations. The level of transparency of your causal body attracts the incarnative environment it needs to further its own evolution, whether those conditions are seen as good or bad. At the higher levels of transparency, the causal body will often take on great suffering because there is a greater compassion manifesting through its vehicles. This evolutionary incarnative process follows a specific archetypal sequence known as the Nine Initiations, which we will explore at the end of this gene key. Even though karma is purified in the after-death state, it can manifest during a single lifetime. The law of cause and effect holds true on the material plane too. However, the material plane is extremely dense, 
which means that we do not always see the results of our good or bad actions, thoughts, or words quickly. Having said this, we are now living in a time towards the end of a great epoch, and at such times natural laws are often seen to bend. The general collective consciousness of humanity has been gathering in the Akashic Ocean for millennia, and as such, it has effectively programmed the way in which that ocean functions. As our consciousness evolves more quickly, the turnaround for the law of divine memory is altering. In other words, karma is speeding up. Soon we will reach a point in evolution where redemption will manifest even on the physical plane. This is the epoch that is coming, the time of healing, the sacred wound that causes human suffering. This last point ought to give us all something to think about regarding the way in which we handle our own emotions and thoughts. Soon, none of us will be able to hide the truth of our acts or feelings. In the not-too-distant future, the 22nd shadow will create almost instantaneous karma whenever someone behaves dishonorably. This will utterly change the way we see ourselves and the world around us. Justice is a universal law. However, human beings at low frequencies too often misinterpret this beautiful law as retribution or revenge. Because of grace, evolution cannot travel backwards, and it is not possible for a form to dissolve. It is all a matter of how finely tuned are the strings of your DNA. If you tune them to the lower frequencies, not only will you prevent yourself from experiencing joyousness, but you will also add to the weight of human karma stored in our collective ancestral DNA. In this sense, all human beings are given the feeling of free will in order to experience the consequences of their own deeds. But the key point here is that we do not learn through punishment and retribution, as so many religions would have us believe. We learn through joyousness and fulfillment, which comes through the 22nd gift, the wonderful gift of graciousness. So, what happens if you're introvert and you are repressing this shadow what's the repressive nature of dishonor how do you manifest this internally you become proper so these are the people that always act proper and they always say the right things at the right time but it's an act they're acting proper because they're counting on their image to save them not on themselves, but their image. So repressive nature, proper. The 22nd shadow and its repressive phase gives rise to a deeply false sense of character. These people may appear outwardly very balanced, calm, and proper. They can often be extremely socially adept. Inwardly, however, their emotions are often seething. They hide deep sexual lusts and often foster deep hatreds and resentments. A good archetype of purity is the Victorian age in Great Britain. On the surface, the general culture was one of politeness and control, when in fact it concealed an underworld of repressed passion, sexuality, and aggression. All the repressed shadows are rooted in a deep-seated fear. The fear of the 22nd shadow is the fear of losing control. We should remember that no shadow is in itself bad. It matters how we deal with it. If you have a repressive nature, you can use it positively to transform inward negativity rather than letting it stew until it erupts. However, if there is no sense of virtue in these people, this shadow can conceal the most violent and explosive of natures. What happens if you're an extrovert within the shadow of dishonor? So how do you manifest this shadow extrovertly? The reactive nature is inappropriate. You become inappropriate. The reactive version of the 22nd shadow manifests as inappropriate or antisocial behavior. These people cannot control their emotional reactions. They often lead fairly disreputable but passionate lives, wearing their hearts on their sleeves. Their actions and behaviors are usually destructive, initially more towards others than themselves. Even in its shadow, this archetype has such creative power that these people can produce wonderful art or music. But so often their inability to handle their own passions and treat others with respect leaves their private lives in tatters. Above all, these people have an inability to listen, either to others or to themselves. Thus, even when their intentions are good, they are doomed to be mistimed and misunderstood. Humanity is definitely in this shadow, 
because we haven't hit the level of the gift yet. So I personally know a lot of people that are manifesting this as, look how proper I am. They constantly calculate what they're going to say, how they're going to do it, what they're going to do, where are they going to go. Everything's calculated and therefore you can control how you look. So therefore you look proper in the eyes of others. It's not to shun anybody. It's just to say how common this is. A lot of people wear masks. A lot of people are acting proper instead of acting authentic. And I was in the reactive side of this when I was young. I was saying the wrong thing at the wrong time, not intentionally, like my intentions were good, but I would walk into a room and say something and it would be like the wrong thing at the wrong time. Very inappropriate, very socially awkward. I hated to be controlled, so then I would act out. I would wear my emotions on the sleeves because you, you can't hide it. You're, you're not proper, right? You're the opposite of proper. So you can't hide your emotions. So I used to be very hot-tempered. I used to be very hot-tempered, lash out, you know. But you work on that with time. Because lashing out and throwing things at people and getting mad and angry is never, ever good. Because you might release energy at that time, but again, that energy is coming back to you. So you're lashing out thinking that you're balancing energy, but you're not. You're worsening the situation. You're adding to the collective karma. So what's best in this case is to get out of the shadow and onto the wonderful gift. The 22nd gift of graciousness. So the 22nd gift is graciousness. So you come out of the shadow of dishonor, either being proper or inappropriate, and you get out of that shadow through becoming graciousness. Because you can't fight negative with negative. You can't fight fire with fire. You have to be the opposite. The milk of human kindness, the 22nd gift, is the gift of graciousness. It is a rare and beautiful quality that has a profound effect on everyone it touches. Graciousness means that whatever you do in life, you always consider the feelings of others. This is one of the great social gifts, and if it is a part of your hologenetic profile, which can be found at genekeys.com, then your whole life is geared towards impacting people's emotions in a positive way. Even if this gift is not a primary aspect of your profile, it still has a huge capacity to completely transform your life and the lives of everyone you meet. The 22nd gift is not just about steering people's feelings, but also about touching their hearts and even their souls. Graciousness means that you act with grace and consideration in everything you do. Just like its shadow, the 22nd gift is extremely powerful in its effect upon others. As the shadow can leave another feeling utterly dishonored and disturbed, the gift of graciousness can greatly help others become free of their negatively charged emotions. There is a professional kindness at the core of this gift that can elevate others beyond their normal consciousness to states of love, laughter, or tears. For this reason, many people connected with this gift assume artistic, musical, or vocal roles in life, where they can influence others through their natural social grace. As we saw with the shadow, people at the lower aspects of this gene key do not acknowledge their accountability for what they say or do. At the gift level, however, you begin to see that all is interconnected, all things and all people. You realize at a deep level that we are all being listened to, and you inherently know that if you do someone an injustice, it will come back to you. This in turn means that other people feel deeply understood and listened to around this gift. This profound awareness of karma means that a great deal of your work and life will lie in the sphere of relationships and the emotions. At the gift frequency of this gene key, you learn to temper your own emotions, releasing them safely without disrespecting others or yourself. With the gift of graciousness, you begin to disperse your own karma and that of your ancestral DNA. This is a huge task, and it means that even though your relationships may be deeply challenging, you always maintain a frequency of respect around others. The 22nd gift also ensures that you balance your respect of others with a healthy dose of self-respect by not allowing yourself to become a victim of someone else's emotions. 
This delicate balance between service and self-love marks you as someone who profoundly understands the power of emotional suffering. Because of this, others will look to you for guidance and authority. The gift of graciousness might also be called the gift of soul. It is the ability to live life to the full, holding no feelings back, whilst at the same time having deep respect for the feelings of others. If you are fortunate enough to tap into the higher qualities of the 22nd gift, your life can be filled with art, music, romance, deep relationships, and enchantment. But above all else, this is the gift of living life from a place of deep love and soul. The Venus Sequence A Direct Transmission of Graciousness In the summer of 2004, during a rare transit of the planet Venus across the front of the Sun, a profound knowledge came into the world. Called the Venus Sequence, it uses the 64 gene keys in combination with astrological data to pinpoint the exact patterns of karma that an individual takes on during each incarnation. The Venus Sequence reveals karma as a genetic sequence that unfolds throughout your life. Your ability to accept this karma with graciousness determines how quickly and easily you transcend your own suffering. Furthermore, as the sequence of your own karma unfolds and is transmuted, it reveals the higher frequencies that allow you to expand your consciousness and attain the higher states. The Venus Sequence is the greater science of human suffering, showing us precisely how every human being shares in world karma or the sacred wound through being genetically imprinted with it at the point of our conception. As we unravel our Venus sequence, we discover an inner path of awakening behind our suffering. This culminates in our having to embrace one of the six essential core human wounds. So the six core wounds of humanity. We have number one, repression. Number two, denial. Number three, shame. Number four, rejection. Number five, guilt. And number six, separation. These six patterns are laid down in a unique sequence in your DNA. Once you have access to your own sequence, you will finally understand the basic script of your life process, particularly as it regards to your relationships, where your karma is mostly played out. The wound itself is directly tied to the lower three bodies, the physical, emotional, and mental. Through clear mental understanding and a gentle emotional process of self-forgiveness, the very patterns that cause human beings so much pain actually lead us directly to liberation through their higher three bodies. This is both a process of evolution described in death in the 55th gene key and a process of involution whereby the higher frequencies within your DNA are being activated through the agency of grace. However, the prime teaching of the Venus sequence concerns showing another human being through relationship how to take responsibility for their own feelings instead of projecting them onto others. This ability is the very essence of the 22nd gift of graciousness and is preparing humanity to make the great leap into freedom, the 55th gift. So what happens if you're in the gift of graciousness for a while? So you're gracious. You're not projecting any emotions anymore. You're not throwing bad energy into the world anymore. You actually receive the energy, you transmute it, you process it. You only put out creativity and beauty through the vibration that you just alchemized. So the 22nd city, grace. So once you're in the gift level for a while, you hit the 22nd city. So the 22nd city is grace, the one and only grace. So you have to go through this honor then through graciousness to finally hit the level of grace. The 22nd city, grace. The seven sacred seals and the biological apocalypse. In the sacred book of Revelation, Saint John the Divine wrote down his famous description of the apocalypse, the so-called judgment day, where all world karma is finally redeemed and all human suffering brought to an end. Despite centuries of misunderstanding by religion, the Revelation of St. John contains some of the greatest initiatic secrets ever written down. One of these secret teachings is known as the Seven Sacred Seals. In allegorical form, St. John describes the sequential process of the opening of each of the seven seals by an angel. 
and the subsequent unfolding of the seven stages of the apocalypse itself. It is not until the final seventh seal is opened that evil is conquered and humanity ascends to a higher plane. When we decipher this allegory, we can see that each of the seven seals and its accompanying angel represents an agent of grace, as involving spiritual force or city descending from the higher vehicles and directly affecting human DNA. The apocalypse is really a biological phenomenon, a judgment day within our genes as a new species of human prepares to be born. Within the matrix of the 64 gene keys, there are six gene keys that directly reflect this involving power of grace, the seventh being the 22nd city of grace itself. So the seven sacred seals in their respective cities. The first seal, divine will, city number 40. The second seal, omniscience, CD number 17. The third seal, universal love, CD number 25. The fourth seal, epiphany, CD number 43. The fifth seal, forgiveness, CD number 4. The sixth seal, truth, CD number 63. And the seventh seal, grace, CD number 22. The 22nd CD of grace always works through the field of these six cities or divine attributes. Thus, we can see that each of these sacred seals is a divine code sent down from higher consciousness to heal a specific aspect of the sacred wound. Just as there are six aspects of the sacred wound, so there are six divine aspects responsible for healing that wound. This process takes place both individually and collectively and is described below. The opening of the first seal, Divine Will. The first seal is opened by the city of Divine Will which heals human repression. Repression is the primary wound of humanity since it refers to the very storage of karma in the DNA of the physical body. It is because of the layers and layers of karma in your DNA that the higher subtle bodies are obscured from your awareness. Karma is a deep physical tension expressed as fear and it inhabits every cell of your body. Only through the grace of the 40th city can this karma be transmuted. The 40th city represents divine will, which is the only force powerful enough to transform all the layers of tension. Divine will actually means complete relaxation. So as this seal opens throughout humanity, the physical body finally comes into complete relaxation. As it relaxes progressively into deeper and deeper states, the higher subtle bodies can express themselves fully. In the end, your body becomes nothing more than a completely relaxed instrument of the divine will. Because this seal has to do with releasing core tension from the physical body at a collective level, it will eventually eradicate all disease from our planet. The opening of the second seal, Omniscience. The second seal is opened by the 17th city of Omniscience, and its target is the wound of denial. Denial is the external expression of fear as anger and aggression. If your core wound is denial, then you are unable to see and take responsibility for your own negative behavior. The more someone tries to show you your denial, the more powerful it becomes. Throughout humanity, this wound expresses itself through fundamentalism, violence, and sexuality. The only force that can break denial is omniscience, which is what occurs when even if only for a split second, your vision is opened and your higher bodies literally look down into your mental and astral bodies. This notion of being seen through comes as a deep shock to the recipient, who usually experiences a complete and permanent rebirth after the events. Once you can see your own denial, it is no longer denial. It is through the opening of the second seal that certain people experience sudden conversions or higher callings. At the collective level, this seal will bring great healing to human sexuality and will eventually extinguish violence. The opening of the third seal, universal love. The third seal is opened through the 25th city of universal love. This is one of the most pervasive forms of divine grace. And as it reaches down into human beings, it triggers a huge wave of release that can spread from person to person like a positive virus. The seal heals the human wound of shame. Shame has brought about a profound feeling of worthlessness. It is out of this feeling of deep shame that the whole world of hierarchy and competitiveness has come about. As the city of universal love descends into humanity, 
our urge to escape our own shame through selfishness and greed gives way to feelings of great joy and self-love. It is this self-love that leads to altruism and philanthropy rather than competition. Shame is obsessed with hiding. But universal love shows you that no matter where you hide, love is still there. It is through the opening of this third seal that you finally begin to enjoy life for what it is rather than always chasing some ideal future. As humanity experiences this opening, it will lead to a complete breakthrough in the way we use money and a final ending to human greed. The opening of the fourth seal, Epiphany. The fourth seal is opened by the 43rd city of Epiphany. Symbolized by the descent of the Dove of Peace. Epiphany heals the wound of rejection, the wound that keeps human beings from opening their hearts fully to one another. Epiphany is actually a shattering experience in which the higher three bodies, symbolized by the gifts of the three Magis, of the Christian Epiphany, explode through into the lower bodies, opening the heart from the inside. As this seal is opened, the many barriers that humans have erected will begin to fall away. Our countries, borders, armies, and all aspects that attempt to protect and defend us from each other. On an individual level, the fourth seal opens the potential for you to lead a truly romantic life where you need hide nothing from anyone, and in which you wear your heart openly on your sleeve. Once human beings overcome the fear of external rejection, they become pure agents of grace, through their friendliness, openness, and honesty. On a collective level, this seal opens the heart center in humanity and manifests us kindness. The city will bring an end to world poverty. Finally, that I can't wait. The opening of the fifth seal, forgiveness. The fifth seal is opened through the fourth city of forgiveness. As one of the great involving cities of grace, forgiveness has a special purpose to work its way backwards into the collective DNA of humanity, releasing the many karmic blocks that plague the various gene pools. The fifth seal is specifically targeted to heal the patterns of unconscious guilt upon which karma is built. Guilt is a kind of karmic debt, which exists between one person and another, or even between one race and another. As the power of forgiveness works its way into the human genome, so many ancestral curses will finally be lifted. The seal in particular has the capacity to create world peace, as individuals and whole nations forgive others the debt they are owed. The grace that comes with forgiveness has unprecedented power and brings a sense of true justice back to humanity. Forgiveness is a direct manifestation of the fifth body, the buddhic body, which has the capacity to literally burn karma out of our DNA. At a collective level, the releasing of all this world karma will bring an end to war. The opening of the sixth seal, truth. As the final stage in the sequence, the seventh is the glorious afterglow, the sixth seal delivers the coup de grace as it heals the ultimate human wound, that of separation. Because to most of us, the higher realities of our true nature are obscured, we have essentially been separated from the divine for most of our lives. Because we feel this separation so keenly, we constantly seek fulfillment in the outer world. Ironically, it is this very seeking that keeps us from experiencing our true nature, which is to be found deep within our own suffering. The opening of the sixth seal is made possible through the 63rd city of truth. Truth is something you become one with, rather than something you find out there. Through the opening of the seal, every individual will come to know their true nature as an aspect of our vast consciousness. Absolute truth is a collective phenomenon that will one day be fully embodied as the whole of humanity spontaneously recognizes itself as a single divine organism. Only then, at that marvelousness or marvelous moment, will all human seeking and striving come to an end. So it is that the 63rd city, through its direct realization and expansive embodiment, will bring a crushing end to the greatest of human curses, indifference. The opening of the seventh seal, grace. In the book of Revelations, the opening of the seventh seal is surrounded by layer upon layer of rich apocalyptic imagery. Unless you are well versed in alchemical symbolism, it will be very difficult for you to penetrate the true meaning of this wonderful prophetic transmission. There is, moreover, a demarcation between the opening of the first six seals and the opening of the seventh seal. 
The seventh seal involves seven angels and seven trumpets, which sound the final judgment of humanity. The seventh seal is the spirit of grace itself, represented by the 22nd CD, and grace descends only after great transmutation. It is like the rainbow that appears after the great storm, bringing complete transfiguration, the 47th CD. On an individual level, the seventh seal represents the final absorption of all the previous six layers of the human aura into the monadic body, the primordial essence. At this level, even the flood of revelations and high frequencies of the atomic body must be surrendered into the void of what the mystics term the seventh heaven. We are told in the book of Genesis that God rested on the seventh day of creation, and this sevenfold pattern is reflected in many other cultural traditions. In the Hindu system, when the seventh chakra known as Sahasrara blooms, the divine essence can finally reunite with the material plane. St. John describes this event as the coming of a new heaven and a new earth. As this seventh monadic plane absorbs the final vestiges of our separateness, each plane below and its frequencies disintegrate, to be reintegrated as the true monadic essence. This is the meaning of the sounding of the seven trumpets, which represents the seven layers of frequencies of the human aura. At the collective level, the opening of the seventh seal refers to the coming of the final human epoch and the return of the human race to its original Edenic state. It is the great trumpet fanfare announcing the redemption of all beings. The meaning of spiritual initiation. The final aspect of the transition through the 22nd gene key follows the story of the individual human soul itself. All human stories enact the same mythic process or storyline albeit in infinite and uniquely diverse forms. As our incarnative process recycles into new and different forms, each activating different indifferences of human DNA during each lifetime, our great transgenerational story deepens. Like all great drama, we are weaving a multidimensional tapestry of different colors, tones, and hues from the rich fabric of experience. Throughout every incarnative story, however, stands one immutable question that keeps us coming back, the question of our own suffering. It is our changing relationship to this question that marks the various stages in our journey through time and space. There are nine major landmarks along the way, and they are known as the nine portals of planetary initiation. Spiritually, initiation can mean many different things to people. The word initiation itself might conjure up all sorts of mystical rites you may have witnessed or heard of. Certainly, in tribal societies, initiation is seen as a rite of passage, particularly for young men, who must perform some kind of test at a certain threshold age before entering full manhood. Other ancient teachings and or societies have systems of initiation that are performed as elaborate rituals at certain stages in an aspirant's life. In truth, however, spiritual initiation is a natural organic process that occurs to all human beings at a certain point in their lives. In essence, initiation refers to the natural unfolding stages of all spiritual awakening. Initiation occurs to you no matter what you are doing in your life. And once it has begun in earnest, when you have passed through the first initiation, it is irreversible and inevitable. The Nine Portals of Planetary Initiation the nine portals of planetary initiation are a synthesis of the initiation rites of many different cultures and lineages. Listed below are the nine stages, followed by a brief introduction to each. So number one, birth. Number two is baptism. Number three, confirmation. Number four, matrimony. Number five, annunciation. Number six, communion. Number seven, ordination. Number eight, sanctification. And number nine, glorification. So the first initiation, birth. The first initiation marks the very beginning of your journey towards eventual transcendence and enlightenment. This initiation may pass with little or no recognition that anything has occurred within your consciousness. There comes a time in every soul's life when it has to move beyond its basic mammalian survival program. The first stage of passing this threshold really concerns the development of the mental body. In your early evolution, you are simply overwhelmed by the desire nature of the astral body, and this remains the central focus of your whole being. First, it is interested in survival. 
then having mastered survival, it becomes interested only in pleasure. Lifetimes follow in which pleasure is pursued in any and every possible way. In one sense, the soul is trying to define what pleasure or happiness is and how it can be captured. Despite fleeting glimpses of happiness, the soul fills in finding true fulfillment through the outer senses and gradually turns its lens on the real price, suffering itself. In looking into the nature of suffering, the mental body must first detach itself from the astral body, which means that, for the first time, the soul must consider its own nature. This turning inward marks a huge shift in focus in the life of the soul because in looking at its own nature, it must also begin to consider the feelings and thoughts of others. In the deepest sense, the first initiation is a birth out of selfishness and into service in its broadest form. It is marked by the ability and willingness of an individual to accept responsibility for his or her actions. It is the birth of a true morality, not in the sense of adhering to an outer code or set of laws, but of the natural human spirit of helpfulness and harmlessness. After the first initiation, the soul becomes aware of that greater pleasure is derived from giving than from taking, and this becomes the foundation of the higher life. In the world around us today, many people have passed through the first initiation. There is no set of beliefs or any common mission that unites these people that of wanting to leave the world a better place for future generations. They can be spiritual, atheistic, opinionated, even dogmatic, but they cannot be indifferent to their own or another's suffering. And this is what makes them so powerful and so precious. The second initiation, baptism. The second initiation is very different from the first, whereas the first initiation is a general buildup of basic human goodness over a long period, the second initiation of baptism comes as a surprise. At the second initiation, the spirit of grace descends through the layers or bodies of form and bestows a moment of higher contact upon the recipient. Baptism is a sudden immersion in the higher frequencies of your own higher vehicles, and as such, it always comes as something of a shock. As with all shock, it takes a long time to come to terms with what has happened to you. The duration of the experience varies greatly from person to person, and as the higher frequencies subside, the lower bodies are left with the task of recalibrating and readjusting to the influx of the new frequencies. During this period of readjustment, many things may take place within an individual. The existing mental framework tries to place the experience within its old paradigm or within a paradigm recognized by society. Many people experience the second initiation as a higher calling into one of the greater religions. Others continue to grapple with the experience and may even go through a mental or nervous breakdown. Another common response is prolonged depression and a longing to return to the high frequency state. Still others may even go into denial and try to forget the experience altogether. Baptism as such can be extremely challenging as it sets you apart from the rest of society in some way. It is, in a sense, a kind of purgatory, since you have tasted the higher life and can never entirely forget it. If you are able to handle the frequencies of the higher bodies and can incorporate the experience cleanly in your life, grace will periodically revisit you and baptize you, and the higher frequencies of the causal body. The second initiation is an ongoing baptism in the higher reality, and the more readily the experience is digested, the more energy becomes available to you. We need to remember that the bodies above the causal body constitute your higher self. They know exactly how and when to allow the higher frequencies down into the lower vehicles. The period after the second initiation may also last many lifetimes as the causal body gains a stronger foothold over the astral and mental bodies, the sexual and intellectual faculties. Baptism is thus an initiation into purification in which your lower essences are gradually refined in order to be able to hold a more sustained higher vibration. The third initiation, confirmation. In some traditions, the third initiation is understood to be the first true initiation because it is not until this confirmation arrives that a person becomes stable in their purpose of seeking the divine. Confirmation is another gift of grace that is given as a kind of reward to the recipient. 
It is evident from their names that these initiations are taken from the Christian tradition. Their mystery can be further understood through the original layout of the Christian church. The birth represents the entry into the church itself, the body of the higher presence. The baptism is always made at the front, which is usually located at the back of the church, between the entrance and the congregation, and represents the introduction of the child as a member of the church. During Christian confirmation, a young person is officially initiated as a member of the congregation, whose arena is the main body of the church itself. Confirmation gives the young church member their first taste of a much higher initiation, that of the Holy Communion. In the list of the nine initiations above, you can see that they are laid out in threes. This is one of the great mysteries of initiation, which is based upon final immersion into the Holy Trinity. At each of the three levels, the seeker enters into deeper communion with the triple nature of the Trinity. Thus, at the third initiation, the seeker has a taste of the sixth initiation and very faintly detects the echo of the ninth initiation. So it is with each of the other levels. Confirmation is actually a fairly high vibrational initiation. It denotes having reached a stable frequency in which your commitment has been tested and found strong and your lower nature has shown itself to be capable of some degree of sacrifice. At this level, the mystery of sacrifice is understood to be the deepest core of initiation itself. Here at the confirmation, you will grasp the certainty of your final goal, in which your lower nature will be sacrificed to your higher. After the third initiation, it is no longer possible for you to leave the path of initiation, even though you will inevitably still stray from it at times. This is a level of frequency in which you become used to more regular periods of contact with the higher vehicles. The pathway between the causal and the mental body is well trodden, which means that simply by heartfelt invocation, you can now call upon grace. Portal number four, the fourth initiation, matrimony. The fourth initiation represents the higher octave of the first initiation of birth. Matrimony is a birth into a higher dimension. It is a spontaneous inner commitment that greatly widens the pathway of awareness inside your being. The initiation of matrimony or marriage is your first step into the collective way of life. In the Christian mystical traditions, matrimony represents the marriage of the seeker to Christ, a very deep level of commitment that actually led to the beginning of the monastic tradition. The modern cultural institution of marriage still contains many of the sacred initiatic rites that mark this high stage of consciousness. The primary symbol of matrimony is the wedding ring, the emblem of sacred union and divine perfection. The fourth initiation marks the beginning of the higher life in which your primary focus is to incarnate the causal body fully onto the physical plane. This means that your life's work is now offered in service of the whole, and there is no difference between your work and worship. The well-known wedding vow until death us do part now becomes your living reality and your only true beloved is the higher self of your divine consciousness. Externally, this period of your life story is usually marked by deep service to humanity in which you are much concerned with improving the welfare of those less fortunate than yourself. You may recall that the causal body is the body of our enduring virtue, being the sum total of all that is good about us. After the fourth initiation, our lower nature becomes increasingly more organized by the causal body. Our sexual energies in particular are channeled into creative work of a higher nature. Just as physical marriage precedes the raising of a physical family, so this higher marriage can lead to a vast surge and creativity that can involve and awaken many others. It is of interest to know that this is not just individuals who move through the great initiations, but also entire species. Humanity has in fact passed through the fourth initiation during the past few hundred years. Our matrimony has vastly improved the state of the world in which we live. The steady growth of the global awareness is outstripping individual greed. Politically, the rise in democracy and social justice has changed the face of the planet. Gradually, human goodness is moving us forward, even though news headlines do not often reflect this truth. To understand initiation, you must read between the lines and you must feel the truth with your heart as much as see it with your mind. As a species, we are closer than we have ever been to the ideal of working together collectively as a single unified organism. 
Matrimony has many hidden meanings. It can refer to the marriage of opposites, of East and West, science and religion, the masculine and the feminine. Inside your DNA, it speaks of a fusion, an intense period in which the many opposites within your being mystically come together into greater harmony than ever before. In the analogy of the church, it is when you are singled out within the congression and approach the higher altar together with your betrothed. It is represented in the sacred geometry of the church by the crossing and the great side windows of the nave, the open arms of the church lying between the congression and the choir. It is a place of expansion where the body of the church opens out on both sides like two spreading wings. This is exactly what the fourth initiation denotes, a time in which you open your heart to the world and spread your wings to the winds of the Holy Spirit of grace. The fifth initiation, Annunciation. This is where we're at, globally. The fifth initiation flows naturally from the fourth. And at this level of expanded awareness, the initiations often follow each other in relatively quick succession. That is, within a single lifetime. Now that you are married to your higher consciousness, the next thing that happens is that you become pregnant. This is the Annunciation, the mystical announcement of the imminent birth of the Christ. Much of the symbolism surrounding this fifth initiation is feminine in origin, flowing as it does from the third aspect of the sacred trinity, the Holy Mother. On the lower planes, the feminine is expressed through the astral plane, the desire, nature, and emotions. At a higher level, this plane relates to the fifth or buddhic body. At the fifth initiation, the exquisite emanation and refined currents from the buddhic body begin to penetrate the lower astral nature. This is a deeply tantric phenomenon in which you experience the sublimation of your sexuality into pure spiritual essence. The Annunciation is a chemical phenomenon that saturates your whole being. Just as a woman during pregnancy is flooded with hormones, so you become aware that your body is being purified and cleansed in preparation for a great inner event, the birth of Christ consciousness. In the analogy of the church, this initiation relates to the situation of the choir, who presides over the altar, and who represents the voice of pure worship of the Godhead. The connection between the throat center and the sexual center also becomes clear during this initiation. When a person spontaneously enters a higher ecstatic state that appears to be ongoing, it is a fair assumption that they are entering this fifth portal of Annunciation. Many different mystical traditions speak of this magical time of higher pregnancy, in which the immortal fetus is gestating inside our solar plexus center. It is one of the great enduring mysteries of creation. In terms of the initiation of species, humanity stands at the threshold of the fifth initiation today. Even now, there are whispers in the air of a new form waiting to come into the world. Little do we realize that this form is gestating inside our very DNA. The timeline of a species to undergo any initiation is obviously very different from an individual, and for humanity it may take many hundreds of years for the Annunciation to become realized. We are about to enter a time of great purification, in which the feminine spirit of grace will be working actively in the world. The fact is that as a species we have already been fertilized and are in the very first stages of pregnancy. Just as the body of a woman takes several weeks and months to register the changes externally, humanity will not become generally aware of the great change that is upon it for some considerable time. Only those who are sensitive to the subtler currents moving beneath the world of matter will detect the first signs of the new human that has now begun its period of gestation. So the sixth initiation, communion. The sixth initiation is the greatest experience a human being can have. It represents the zenith of our human development and the end of our evolution on the earth. The mystery of Holy Communion is the mystery of sacrifice. This is the full awakening of the Christ consciousness in a human vehicle, which requires the death of that which identifies with the principle of form itself. This stage is often referred to as enlightenment. The light referred to is the pure light of the sixth body, the atomic body, which is born from within the buddhic body and enlightens the lower three bodies. As it does so, it causes the causal body to dissolve, thus severing the link or bridge between the lower and higher worlds. 
In mystical terms, this involves the dissolution of the soul, that aspect of human consciousness that is drawn again and again into incarnation. Thus, it is said that at the point of enlightenment, the indwelling awareness can no longer take incarnation and forever escapes the wheel of samsara or illusion. The initiation of communion also shares its name with the 45th city, which describes the great mystery of the taking of the sacred sacrament. The communion involves a direct imbibing of divine consciousness at the altar. In entering this field of frequency, you are transcending all sense of being separate from others. This is symbolized by the blood of Christ and marks the final breaking up of the karmic residue held in your DNA. For the grace of Christ to enter you, you must be willing to make the ultimate sacrifice, to give up your lower bodies and their desires, feelings, memories, dreams, and knowledge, and to be taken over by the greater being who has been waiting all along within you. To enter this great initiation is to die into the second aspect of the sacred trinity, the Christ. The higher evolution in the seventh and eighth and ninth initiations. The remaining three initiations are part of what is called the higher evolution, which lies beyond humanity and our human story. As such, they are difficult to describe in words, and certain binding oaths surround them in order to protect humans from their dangerous frequencies. These frequencies are no longer conveyable other than through sound or through direct transmission in silence. Even so, the higher evolution has always been known about, and fragments of truth concerning it can be found throughout human culture. In the Christian church, the higher evolution is represented through the priesthood and its hierarchies. The seventh initiation of ordination has much to do with the notion of coordination, and these incarnations point humanity in specific new directions. It is through these beings that the higher secrets of initiation may be released. The presence of such beings in the world always precipitates a great shift in the consciousness of the whole planet. Interestingly, there are always five avatars present on the earth at any given moment. They form a unified force field that steers the balance of humanity towards evolution rather than destruction. The eighth initiation of sanctification is an extremely rare event on our planet. Initiations at this level are really beyond human understanding as they have to do with the flow of essence from the seventh monadic body into the atomic and buddhic bodies. Although it does occasionally occur on an individual level with spectacular results, the eighth initiation is a collective initiation that can only be taken towards the end of humanity's evolution. The ninth and final initiation brings an end to the story of consciousness. On an individual level, the ninth initiation can only take place through silence. In certain esoteric traditions, it is also referred to as the refusal. After this initiation, the indwelling awareness refuses to materialize and dissolves back into the primordial essence from which it was born. Tradition tells us that only a very few great initiates have taken the ninth initiation to date. It is during this final initiation that the first body and the seventh body fuse together. The physical form then ascends and completes its final great destiny. The new heaven and the new earth. One can see from the depth of its transmission that the 22nd city is difficult to describe in words. The reason for this is that you need to experience it in order to know what it is. Although grace is a word that is often used in spiritual circles these days, it should not be used lightly. Rather, it needs to be treated with the utmost respect. We have learned that grace has to be earned through graciousness. This is the great message of the 22nd Gene Key, to find graciousness in the face of suffering, and perhaps even to find something more, holiness itself wearing a disguise. If the 22nd Gene Key happens to be an aspect of your hologenetic profile, then the theme of grace will be very strong in your life, and you must not turn your face away from the pain life offers you. We are all here to be tested, over and over, until we show that our faith in nature herself can never again be lost. Grace is a presence that descends on humanity, and like all the cities, it requires that we meet it halfway, which for us humans may seem a very long way. This is, after all, a perfected state in which everything about you and your life will be changed permanently. When true grace descends, it wipes out all your past karma in a flash. 
It also wipes out the karma of all your ancestors and all their ancestors. Grace softens your rough edges, puts a permanent end to your fear, and leaves you in no doubt whatsoever about your divinity. It also ensures that you never again forget. It is impossible to measure in words the sheer number of blessings that grace bestows when it alights on us. One who has been touched by grace is always touched by grace. If it happened to you one millennia ago in another universe or in another incarnation, it will never leave you. It will go on bathing you again and again. To be in the presence of someone manifesting the city is to be entranced by the aura of love that surrounds them. It is something you can never forget, and it will steer your own soul to seek it until you find it. Grace is the very breath of the divine. It's always there, waiting for us high above, if we only persist in our sacrifices. Whenever there is oppression, there is a possibility of grace. If you can face oppression with a gracious spirit and a forgiving heart, grace will come to you sooner or later. Grace is a feminine spirit, and she cannot resist giving herself to those who smile in the face of adversity. As we saw with this 22nd shadow, there is nowhere you can hide in the universe. Everything is heard and recorded. Neither can you hide from grace. Grace is your true nature. It is your inheritance. It is the soul of the world. It is also a state that is beyond the laws of our world. If grace touches you, you no longer create karma. If grace touches you, you no longer have your own destiny but become a musical instrument tuned and played by the gods. With grace, all human emotion is instantly transformed into love. It is not a state with which most human beings are very familiar. As a species, however, we are moving into a new epoch that will be marked by grace. As each of the seven seals is opened, the world we have become used to will begin to drop away. Its place will rise shining and resplendent as the summer sun, the new heaven, and the new earth that St. John talked about in his great revelation. Now that you have imbibed this profound transmission that is the 22nd gene key, it is recommended that you give it some time to digest within the many layers of your being. Give it some time, contemplate it. So I bought another book from Richard Rudd called The Art of Contemplation that I'm currently starting to read. So contemplation is also very important. As a feminine spirit, Grace calls upon each of us to listen and receive her message and blessings. Above all, remember this through grace. The universe has but one wish, for you to remember that you are love, and there is nothing in you but love. So another wonderful city. So just a quick summarization. I'm not going to summarize everything, but you're in the shadow of dishonor. You're either acting proper by faking it, or you're inappropriate by being, you know, inappropriate saying the wrong thing at the wrong time, having the bad timing, just, you know, dishonoring yourself and others. You come out of that shadow through graciousness. You learn to be graceful in the eyes of adversity. Once you're graceful for a while, then the frequency of grace touches you. And you have to go through the many bodies and through the many seals. And, and you know, there's many explanations on how you get to grace. But once grace touches you, it never leaves. You become grace. Your incarnation, your karma, everything dissipates and you become grace in the eyes of adversity. Anything that happens, you remain grace. So I'm going to keep it short because I'm losing my voice. I feel like I just left a concert. So wonderful, wonderful gene key. One for the books, extremely important and therefore, hence why this video is longer than the others. So please take the time to contemplate this, digest it. Thank you very much for your support. Thank you for your likes, your comments, your participation, your encouragement. And um, please subscribe if you like the material so that you can be informed when the next video comes out. So thank you very much. God bless every single one of you. Ciao.